Many of us come here with a heavy heart tonight, with a great sense of uh, confusion and disbelief, with sadness. And um, <clears throat> disbelief. And so we're here together to find our path forward together as a community, as Americans and as Jews. We had planned for tonight the first of four lectures in partnership with the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. We are incredibly proud of the partnership with the Hartman Institute and to uh, be able to examine issues of Jewish community, identity, belonging, and in particular issues pertaining to intermarriage. Uh, we at BJ are embarking on a, an entire year of learning and discovery and conversation, dialogue, which will have these four lectures as the mainstay, and that will have learning in between the lectures, textual learning primarily, and that will have conversation within our community, facilitated, so that everybody can uh, uh, express their opinion and, uh, uh, and learn from each other, exchange ideas. Uh, but given uh, where we are today, November 9th, and for many of us, or for most of us, the unexpected result of this election, uh, we decided, together with the Hartman Institute and its president, Dr. Yehuda Kurtzer, to shift a little bit the topic. It's still about Jewish identity, but we, he will talk about the role of American Jews in the present reality, given where we are today, November 9th. That's the subject he will address tonight. And the lecture about Jewish identity and intermarriage, what's at stake, which was to be presented today, will be presented on December 14th, also Wednesday evening, December 14th, here at 7 p.m. We have begun this work uh, over the high holidays at BJ by addressing some of these issues of Jewish identity. And we have uh, a wonderful task force representing uh, different uh, constituencies within the community, people with different opinions. And I would like just to acknowledge that uh, Mosh Horn and Robin Fleischner are the co-chairs of the task force. They're here tonight. And I would like them to stand because they're doing and uh, leading really wonderful work of which you will hear much more and in which everybody, and I mean everybody, will have an opportunity to participate and to uh, express and to hear and to learn and to grow together. So now to Dr. Yehuda Kurtzer, who is the president of the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America and the leading thinker and author of The Meaning of Israel to American Jews the value of the Jewish past and uh, the value of the Jewish past to the Jewish present and questions of leadership and change in American Jewish life. Yehuda leads the efforts of the Institute across the North American Jewish communal landscape and teaches widely in the, in the Institute's many platforms for rabbis, lay leaders, Jewish professionals, and leaders of other faith communities. By the way, they put together an incredible institute called the Muslim Leadership Institute, which has Muslim American leaders, clergy and leaders from across the country, which they bring together uh, on a regular basis to study both here and in Jerusalem, and which uh, is meant to give these Muslim leaders an understanding of Jewish issues, the Jewish community, 
of Israel and of Zionism, and it's an incredible effort, and they're actually gathering this weekend. Um, so when it says that he teaches to leaders of other faith communities, it really is very significant, uh, some very significant uh, uh, programs. Yehuda received his doctorate in Jewish studies from Harvard University and uh, an MA in religion from Brown University. He's an alumnus of both the Bronfman Youth and Wexner Graduate Fellowships. Previously, Yehuda served as member of the faculty and as the inaugural chair of the Jewish Communal Innovation at Brandeis University. He's the author of Shuva, The Future of the Jewish Past, a book that several years ago we studied together and we addressed during the High Holidays, a book which offers new thinking to contemporary Jews on navigating the tensions between history and memory and on how we can relate meaningfully to our past without returning to it. So we'd like to welcome Dr. Yehuda Kurtzer. So good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, thank you for your patience, especially those of you who signed up for a different talk, uh, and your willingness to pivot into this. And I feel personally grateful to have a place to go tonight, uh, to be in community with other people, for a chance to talk about some of the issues that might be at stake, or maybe should be at stake, for how we as American Jews navigate a complicated and surprising moment. And personally, I'm grateful uh, to the rabbis for the chance to change over tonight and think differently about what we should do. I sometimes understand a little bit better an issue after I've been able to teach about it. So this is an opportunity for me to do that. And oftentimes in my teaching and in my lecturing across North America, I speak about the unprecedented nature of America as it has played out for American Jews something radically different about America than all other Jewish diasporic experiences. How lucky we are as Jews to be alive, not just right now in this moment, but at this particular place, this diaspora, which feels or has felt in so many ways totally different than many other diasporic experiences. And oftentimes when I speak about that, depending on oftentimes the age of the audience, the response is something to the effect of, isn't that what they said in Germany in 1932 or in Spain in 1491? And I've tried to argue, I've tried to insist over and over that there is something that is of a category difference between old Jewish diasporas and this Jewish diaspora. And I don't tell this story just to try to be provocative. I feel like I come by it honestly. I have four grandparents born in America, which was a badge of honor and pride until Ann Coulter started tweeting that only people should be allowed to vote in this country are people who have four grandparents born in America taking a page out of the Nuremberg Laws. So I came by honestly to the belief that my upbringing, the child of four grandparents born in America, signaled a kind of belonging and participating in the American story that was different. I feel like I come by it honestly because I feel fortunate to have been the beneficiary of virtually any type of opportunity or experience possible in America for a person who was doing the career path of my choosing. And at no point in my life have I ever felt that Jewishness was in any ways an obstacle to who I was supposed to be in the world. Uh, or even that it was really ever noticed, except to the extent that it provided me advantage. I think this is, in and of itself, one of those signals, one of those moments where we become conscious of the fact that the Jewish experience in America has for a long time been so radically different than the experience of Jews throughout history. And while it's no big deal to walk around New York City wearing a kippah, as I do all the time, in fact, New York City is one of those few places in the world where if you are walking down the street wearing a kippah and you come across another person wearing a kippah, you don't do some form of unspoken acknowledgement of we're on the same team. In New York, you don't do that. But anywhere in America, I have never, literally never, felt an experience of being alien or different or strange except to the extent that everyone in America can be a little bit strange. 
So I don't tell this story just to be provocative. I feel like I come by it honestly. But the reason that I tell this story is because I'm trying, and I feel like this is a core feature of my teaching and a lot of the work that we try to do, to catalyze a different conversation by American Jews, one that asks us what's incumbent upon us as Americans and as Jews when we live in such unprecedented conditions of power, prosperity, affluence, and influence. Or put differently, part of being alive in 2016 means we're awake to a reality that both Jews in Israel and Jews in America seem to be capable of answering the first time, for the first time in our history, the question of the Kuzari, the question of Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, who had written a thousand years ago in his Apologetic for Judaism. And just keep in mind, when you write an apologetic for your own tradition, you try to answer all of the possible questions that someone would ask. That's the point of an apologetic. And in the context of writing an apologetic for Jewish tradition, he actually stumps himself. He asks a question that he's incapable of answering. And the question that he asks, spoken from um, the king to the Jew who is making his case for the superiority of the Jewish tradition, is that the king says to him, you Jews are so morally pristine because you have never been in charge and you have never had power. What will happen to you when you yourselves have, are in charge of others and have power? And in an apologetic that he's writing for the Jewish tradition, he stumps himself and is silent, signaling that for much of Jewish history, we have waited for the opportunities when we would have power and responsibility, not just over our own people, but over others, where we would have the levels of affluence and influence that would challenge us to ask whether Jewish tradition is actually capable of speaking with a moral discourse about those types of challenges, and not merely a Jewish tradition would not merely be a vehicle that we would use to talk about our own self-preservation and protection, but would challenge us about whether we're capable of transcending our obligations to ourselves and being responsible for others. And so for the first time, and we know this is the case in Israel, but it, I believe it is the case or has been the case for American Jews as well, we have challenges in terms of our affluence, our privilege, and our responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis others. And the reason why to talk about how unique the American Jewish experience has been is precisely to invite in our community the degree of moral responsibility, of self-reflection, and hopefully of altruistic moral consciousness that that question means to prompt. The easiest way to avoid that question is to deny the diagnosis of the atmosphere to claim that it's not as good as we say it is. Because the more that you insist that it's not as good as you say it is, then you defer all of these obligations and refocus our community's resources exclusively towards safety and survival. Almost by definition, any sort of this type of moral commitment is altruistic by nature. It's designed towards those who are not under, who are not of your own people, but who may be in some ways under your power. They are directed to others rather than ourselves. And so the easiest way to avoid that direction of resources and to in, is to insist that it's not as good as we think it is. And if we convince enough people that America is not as good as we think it is, then we can invest the majority of our communal resources mean, merely and exclusively in our own protection, towards our own survival, and towards our own safety. I try to think that when I tell this story about how good it is to be an American Jew at this moment, that I'm also trying to make us think about what Jewish particularism means when we're actually so widely accepted by others. And this is a question that we will navigate over the course of this year in our, in our conversation in our curriculum around intermarriage. But the point of talking about what it means to thrive as Jews in America right now is not to avoid the fact or to ignore what many people have observed, which is that when societies are very good for Jews, they are sometimes not particularly good for Judaism. Or as Roger Kamenetz puts it, Jewish identity as it has evolved in the West today could be a real barrier to encountering the depths of Judaism. Right? There are ways in which when we focus on safety and survival, or when we talk about how great it is to be a Jew in America today, that means a thinning out of the content and meaning of Jewish identity and simply fitting in 
assimilating, one of those great words that we used to take pride in that we now see as the problem. We sometimes imagine that talking about what, how we thrive in America is an abandonment of our Judaism, and that's not my goal. The reason to talk about what it means to be an American Jew today is to precisely challenge us to take seriously what a rigorous and robust Jewish identity looks like in an environment of cultural thriving, and at the same time to invite of ourselves the moral responsibility and the moral discourse to think about what we do as a result of all of that thriving. I have believed that this context of American acceptance, I've felt this my whole life, and the alignment between Jewish values and American values, and we'll come back to that shortly. <laughs> the alignment between Jewish values and American values is an unprecedented opportunity for Jews to both be upstanding moral citizens of the society in which we're in, as well as citizens of our own community and our own people. And then there's no contradiction or, comp or even competition between each of those positions. Tonight it feels a little bit different. Tonight this story that I feel that I have been telling over and over that many of you share, maybe many of you have grown up with, maybe this story that some of you have been skeptical of for a long time, is challenged by the results of the election, the anti-Semitic dog whistling that existed throughout the election. If you want to see a little bit of this, just go on social media for an hour or two. Something dramatic seems to have happened in the experience of both what it means to be Americans, but especially for our purposes, what it means to actually be American Jews. And I feel confronted, and this is really a personal revelation based on something that feels like it has shifted. I feel confronted tonight by the possibility that the story I've been telling myself about this place in which I live, in which my parents were born, in which my grandparents were born, that story is more mythical than I've ever actually allowed it to be, both about America and also about other Jews in America who seem to be interpreting this moment really differently, who are living out an experience of being Jewish Americans that is so radically different than mine and that of the people that I'm close to and by whose actions tonight I find myself confused and saddened. David Nirenberg in his book, Anti-Judaism, says as follows. I'll read through it. I'm happy to send it around afterwards. It needs to be unpacked. He says, here we come upon a problem as basic as the nature of knowledge itself. All of our prodigious cognitive and computational abilities are inadequate to a full comprehension of our complex world. As humans, we remain heavily dependent on certain tools of perception and conception that our cultural and biological heritages have taught us are useful. These tools, such as language, causal logic, religion, mathematics, are indeed powerful, but they're powerful precisely because they reduce complexity to intelligibility by projecting our mental concepts onto the world. One consequence of this is that our recognition of significance is always what some philosophers call theory-laden, meaning that it is shaped by what our theoretical frameworks and cognitive tools encourage us to recognize as meaningful. Let me try to summarize what I think he's saying. We tell stories about ourselves, where we come from, the societies in which we live, and those stories stem from theories of how we see and live in a world that's much more complicated than those simple stories. And we need to tell those stories about ourselves and the world in which we're in, both because they serve to interpret the environment in which we're in, as well as because they, they frame our identity choices to operate within that environment. If we simply stood undifferentiated, uninterpreting, in the wake of a complex reality, we wouldn't do anything. We wouldn't, we wouldn't serve any function. We wouldn't understand anything, much less have agency to make change. So we do this all the time. And I guess what I'm interrogating tonight is the legitimacy of the story that I have told for myself and for others so often, fearful that the interrogating of that story is gonna foreclose our moral responsibility to others because it becomes a narcissistic obsession with ourselves. 
I think everybody, everyone in America is actually shocked by the news. You know where I stand with respect to it, but even those who were cheering on the outcome were surprised that it actually came about. And here's what's most jarring. Even those who were cheering for the outcome of a Trump presidency, I think that's the only time I'll say that phrase tonight, those who were cheering it on were cheering it on precisely because it meant to disrupt a coherent story about America that a lot of people don't like. So the challenge to a story about America is not just that it doesn't exist anymore or might not exist anymore, but that it is being deliberately challenged in this moment by people who no longer like it. And what happens to those of us who did? So what I want to do tonight is to unpack this story a little bit further that I've told about myself and about this American experience, this story of thriving and self-confidence uniquely in a diasporic environment. I want to unpack a little bit of that story that maybe some of you hold and that I certainly feel about being a Jew in America. And I want to same time hold alongside it a totally second story that I think many American Jews default to. Many American Jews who you may, some of you may be in this room, who feel some pull of one or both of these stories at different moments at different times. And then I would say there are communities that you'll recognize, where you'd say they are much more in column B than they are in column A. And the second story, too, connotes a whole different set of moral obligations and moral responsibilities. And I want to argue tonight three things. That both of these stories that answer the question of what does it mean to be an American Jew today, both of these stories stem deeply from both the Jewish textual tradition as well as Jewish historical memory. Neither of these stories is so easily dismissed. The second thing I want to argue is that neither of these stories will automatically translate to a left-wing or right-wing set of political consequences. And third, that the path in front of us is to know our story, to claim it, and to then try to pursue the moral responsibilities that come with each story that we tell even more rigorously and vigorously than we already have. We want to know the stories we're telling. We want to probe whether they're right. And then if we're committed to that story, we got to commit whole hog. I'm not sure yet that I'm ready for empathy <laughs> as many people are talking about today, for those who tell radically different stories about being a Jew today. I'm not sure yet I'm ready for that. That could be an inevitable conclusion, that we build greater empathy for those who share different political views. God knows I talk about that a lot in other contexts. I'm not ready yet. I think it's okay to not be ready yet. It feels a little bit raw. But even if the point is not to build empathy for those who you deeply disagree with, I think there's a deep value to becoming transparently aware of the frameworks and stories that we use to tell our stories in the world and to challenge whether that story, that framework still works. And this is why. If we have too pronounced of a gap between the world that we want, that our stories are about, and the world that we actually inhabit, two things could happen. One is that you break. If there's too big of a gap between the world that you want, the one that you tell stories about, and your actual realities, you might experience a deep sense of rupture. And the second risk is that we will turn that longing from the world that we're in to the world that we want into a kind of desperate form of longing and wanting that ultimately is its own form of pathetic. You know, messianism has been the tool of Jewish moral imagination of all time, and it's an extraordinary tool. But when it's totally fake, when all it is is saying, this is the world I'm in now, and in that future world, everything will be perfect, it doesn't actually catalyze us to be morally responsible to close the gap between the world that we're in and the world that we actually want. So I want to ask us, to figure out what our story is, probe whether it's the right one, and then do the work of closing the gap between the story that we tell and the world that we're actually in. The central reason, I think, that we have tended to feel that America is different, this used to be called the Golden of Medina when Jews spoke Jewish, 
is that for at least a century, last century, even times in which American Jews felt profoundly other, there was always a strong affinity between what are called colloquially Jewish values, even though any two Jews will disagree on what Jewish values are, but I mean the big ones. There was always some point of affinity between Jewish values and American values. This is an unusual feature of the American experience, which is different than many of our diasporas. So to give a couple of examples. As early as 1916, I believe, Louis Brandeis, before he was even on the Supreme Court, was writing essays about the ways in which loyalty to Zionism and loyalty to the story of Jewish peoplehood not only was not at odds with being a good American citizen, but being a Zionist made you a better American citizen. Because if you were loyal to your own people, it was like the form of civic involvement that, involved, that required of people to be loyal to their college and their lodge and the, the politics of their town. And so Jews, in being loyal to the Jewish people, were actually playing out a story that made Irish people who were loyal to home rule also better Americans. It's an extraordinary act of juxtaposing that loyalty to one's own people and loyalty to one's own Jewishness not just correlates with American values, but reiterates American values. Or if you fast forward 60, 60, 50, 60 years later, the activity that so many Jewish leaders look back nostalgically on as being the moment when Jews used to believe in Jewish peoplehood, and that's the organizing around the Soviet Jewry issue. Think about how amazing it is that the technology, the idea that would actually organize Jews together to be part of a shared cause was fundamentally a patriotic act because the enemy was the Russians. So cheering on for the, re the, re the, re the release of Soviet Jewry was not a countercultural act of being loyal to my people as opposed to living in a prevailing culture where my values were not being reinforced. Fighting for Jews to be released from the gulag was advocating for the side of Rocky against the Russian. So being on the good side of Jewish values meant you were on the same side of American, um, American values. And perhaps the biggest one of them is that the single biggest Jewish idea that has been most pronounced in Jewish education for, I don't know, the last 40 or 50 years especially in liberal forms of Jewish education. The single most important Jewish idea that if you studied it scientifically would become clear is the most important thing that Jews teach other Jews about what it means to be Jewish is tikkun olam. Your job is even though you are a speck of the world's population, the mission of your religion is not to be good to your own people, but to do something transformative for the entire world which, by the way, correlates quite nicely to a certain narrative of American exceptionalism. In other words, the stories that Jews have told about themselves in America about the central values of what it meant to be Jewish were not countercultural values at all to this prevailing society in which we lived, but correlating and reinforcing values to the society. And so part of the reason why the American Jewish experience has felt so radically different and radically other from many other diasporic experiences, whether in reality or in myth, is that as opposed to the Fiddler on the Roof version of this, of the prayer for the Tsar, right, which is, keep him far away from us, the story of what, uh, the, way, the way American Jews for the last 50 years have talked about our Jewish values, even 100 years, has been that Jewish values and praying for America are actually deeply intertwined. That the longing for what it means to be Jewish is the same of what, it longs, long, what longing for Americanness is ultimately about. Nevertheless, even within that framework, of a large-scale acceptance by so many American Jews that this place is home and this is the place that we are going to fight for, which has been almost across the board by American Jews. Very few American Jews, regardless of their denominational identity, are completely other from American society. Almost on a whole, American Jews have embraced this notion of at-homeness. And yet, even within the context of that at-homeness, we tell two radically different stories. And if you take out the sources that are in front of you, I want to share these stories. They are not descriptively American Jewish stories, 
but I think they tell a better story for America than they even did when they were the rabbis imagining Jewish life in the Roman Empire. The first story, the story that correlates to what I've talked about until now, the story that I think I find myself most drawn to and that feels most familiar, argues that the American Jewish experience has been different in kind than any other diasporic experience that we have. In other words, American, America has been a radical break from diaspora as classically understood in Jewish history and the grounding for a new form of Jewish identity which we'll call self-confidence. You can be a proud American Jew and no one else can take that away from you. Right? Not only will you be a Jew who's running for office, but you'll run for office as a Jew. That was the, one of the extraordinary significances of the Lieberman campaign, was the moment at which it became clear that his Jewishness had moved from at one point in time perhaps a liability to actually in some ways a strategic advantage. Some significant shifts in Jewish political attitudes align this, this attitude of American Jewish identity as a source of pride and self-confidence. The story I want to tell is as follows from Mishnah Vodazara, the fourth chapter. It's a beautiful rabbinic story. It tells you much of what you think will happen in the opening couple of words. Proclos, the son of a philosopher, asked Rabban Gamliel, the head of the rabbinic academy in Akko, when the latter, that is Rabban Gamliel, was bathing in the bathhouse of Aphrodite. Now you don't need to know what the text says next, but I guess you can probably anticipate the question. The Greek guy with the Greek sounding name and with a Greek sounding job, the philosopher, i.e. the anti-Jew, asks the Jewish guy with a Jewish name and a Jewish job, right? He's about to ask him something when said rabbi is bathing in the bathhouse. And not just any bathhouse. There's two elements of this bathhouse that make it troubling. One is the obvious one, it's the bathhouse of Aphrodite. It's an idolatrous pagan bathhouse. But the other, which is a little bit more subtle, is that though he is in the land of Israel, he is in the least Jewish city in the land of Israel, the pagan city of Akko. So the rabbi, the Jew, is out of place. What's the Jew doing in this place out of place? He said to him, the Greek guy says, the philosopher says to the rabbi, it is written in your Torah, let nothing that has been proscribed, nothing forbidden, stick to your hand. You Jews, talk by, based on your own tradition, which by the way signals that part of what happens when Jews live in societies with non-Jews is that non-Jews know our stuff as well as, if not more than we do. Which is another feature of the extraordinary American experience where Jews can actually watch television shows and become educated about their own Jewishness. So the non-Jew says to him, you guys don't, you got, it's not, you're, you're welcome in the bathhouse, but according to your own tradition, you're supposed to keep your distance from things that are forbidden. What are you doing in the bathhouse of Aphrodite? He replied to him first, we don't answer questions relating to Torah in a bathhouse. <laughs> so obviously I think it's intended to be funny, and it's also intended to say, you think you're gonna be asking me Torah questions? You don't know the rules. Rule number one, no Torah in the bathhouse. He also is signaling in that moment, I am not threatened by your question. So I'm going to finish what I'm doing here. If this was an anxious Jewish identity, the anxious Jewish identity would say, oh my goodness, they found out, they're calling us on it. He'd rush out of the bathhouse, grab his clothes, run home, and never appear in a bathhouse again. The confident Jewish identity says, wait outside till I'm done. And then his answer that he actually gives is, when he comes out, he said, I did not go into her domain, she came into mine. People don't say the bath was made as an adornment for Aphrodite, rather they say Aphrodite was made as an adornment for the bath. You silly pagans. She came into my domain, I didn't come into hers. Don't think that the world in which we're living, this diasporic environment, is one that is intrinsically foreign to my values. It's actually neutral. I am an equal stakeholder in everything that is Rome, 
including a bathhouse. The fact that you idolaters come along and stick a statue of Aphrodite on the wall, and you think that by doing that, you have claimed this environment as your own and made me alien to it, that is your, he doesn't use this phrase, but he would have, that is your goyim nachas. That's your non-Jewish thing where you think that this is suddenly a holy place. That's not what this is. In other words, I belong here as much as you do. And this is an extraordinary pivot in a certain approach to Jewish identity, one that suggests we not only belong, but we are responsible for this environment, even if there are all sorts of features and symbols along the way that are themselves foreign to our values. Incidentally, this is what American Jews have done for a long time with Catholic hospitals. The reason why Catholics build hospitals is not just for the altruistic purpose of hospitals, but because there's an underlying theology of healing as part of the Catholic Church. That's why there are so many stories about Jesus as a healer. Do Jews look at those hospitals and say, we don't go into Catholic hospitals? No. We say, hospitals are neutral. We belong here as much as anybody else. You want to stick a cross on the wall, that's fine but you haven't implicated my belonging here as an equal stakeholder and as an equal citizen of this society. The Gamliel story has all sorts of political implications translated as a narrative that American Jews would tell about themselves in America. And as I said at the outset, there's a right-wing version and a left-wing version. The right-wing version of this story describes the commodification of your insiderness as a right that you can then exploit for your own purposes. David Myers and Nomi Stolzenberg, professors at UCLA, have this great article from a few years ago about the controversies in New Square, where a community has essentially used the system to be able to drive resources towards its own um, ultra-Orthodox school system. And what Myers and Stolzenberg correctly note is that that technology is as American as apple pie. You don't have to like it, but what they are doing is simply using the legal system and the courts at their disposal to drive resources to their own community. And in those ways, they are no different than Rabban Gamliel and Aphrodite's bath. Incredibly at home and comfortable in this diasporic environment and using the diasporic environment to flourish on behalf of their own identities. But of course, it's also a left-wing narrative there are left-wing Jews out there, some of you may be of them, who use this framework of belonging and self-confidence in the American context to make the case publicly and loudly that there is no daylight between Jewish values and American values, and to argue very publicly for American values as tools in the American political public square. An example to this effect is the organization Bend the Ark explicitly and publicly deploying the use of Jewish values, not on behalf of a particular community, but arguing this public square, this bathhouse, is ours as much as yours, and we're not going to hide in order to be there. We're going to be Rabban Gamliel in that very bathhouse. In both of these stories, Jewishness is expressed unabashedly as a proud identity that also turns out as a means of deploying or expressing power and influence. This is a big, big story to Jews. I guess where I started tonight is that I am drawn to Rabban Gamliel's story. I think this is how many of us as Jews have come to realize that the bathhouses are as much ours as anybody else and ain't nobody going to tell us otherwise. I'll come back to the challenge that has emerged around that shortly. But there's a different story, a second story, that I want to share tonight as well. And the second story would say, apropos of, isn't that what they said in 1932 in Germany, that America may be different than previous diasporas, but not in kind, only in scale. That the narrative of Jewish history is consistent and vulnerable. That we have a certain deep commitment to a certain lachrymose narrative of Jewish history and Jewish memory, and that maybe America has surprised us by being better than most of the experiences that we've had before, but not really that much. 
And it's this narrative, this story, that invites people to respond to American political moments by quoting biblical verses. So somebody would, might say, and I, this happens throughout this election year and today as well. I saw somebody today on my Facebook thread, a, um, a rabbi posting, his quote in response to the election was, Veha'ir Shushan Navocha, the city of Shushan, where the story of the Purim story takes place, was overwhelmed. The, the, the rhetorical move in quoting that verse is suggesting anything we see today I've seen before. That when a Jew encounters a historical moment, the Jew says, where have I seen this before? <laughs> Realizing that in some ways, there are presence in any society in which we're living is fundamentally vulnerable. I may feel some deep self-confidence right now, but that self-confidence is wedded to a certain fundamental otherness. I don't really belong here, it's almost like if you took that idea, you know the idea of the imposter syndrome, and mapped it onto an entire population of people, the second story that Jews have oftentimes told themselves about diaspora is that we are fundamentally imposters. And it can work out for a long time, but eventually somebody will figure it out, and then when they do, it's not going to work well for us. And more often than not, that attitude of being fundamentally other or different, even if it's working out in the short term, is accompanied by a belief that because we are other and because we're different, we should act different. We should be deliberately countercultural. We should dress differently. We should have a different set of moral values than the ones that are advanced by our society because what's the point of hiding or pretending? In fact, many of the people who are, most, who are loudest about their countercultural choices are most angry at the Jews who, they th who think naively that they can get away with it. You follow that? If I believe that I'm other, if I believe that I'm different, even if anti-Semitism isn't happening today, it's going to happen eventually. So I might as well own it. I might as well think of myself as being fundamentally other, behave other, dress differently, hold myself to a different set of moral or ethical values, because anyway, we're going to be found out. Read the story with me from the Talmud Brachot 61b. Our rabbis taught, once the wicked government issued a decree forbidding the Jews to study and practice the Torah. Again, if you want to summarize an entirety of a text in the first sentence, compare this first sentence to the other first sentence. We know this story before. We have all sorts of holidays that commemorate this story. This is the wicked government issuing a decree as if the Roman Empire has, a lot, has nothing to do but to prevent Jews from studying and practicing the Torah. But the way that this text is telling its story is of radical otherness. We can't be Jews in this society. We are, we are far away from bathhouses. Papos, the son of Judah, another guy with a Greek name. That's why it's so powerful to see the parallels. Another guy with a Greek name comes and finds Rabbi Akiva, publicly bringing gatherings together and occupying himself with Torah. What is Rabbi Akiva doing but doing the subversive act of studying Torah in spite of the very specific prohibition that's been leveled against him? And this Greek guy, and these Greek guys you can see are inserted in here as the rhetorical question asker to, set, to solidify the extent to which we're thinking in otherness or not. He said to him, Akiva, are you not afraid of the government? He replied, I will explain to you with a parable. A fox was once walking alongside a river and he saw fishes going in swarms from one place to another. The fox said to the fish, from what are you fleeing? They replied, we're fleeing from the nets that are cast for us by men. The fox said to the fish, would you like to come up on the dry land so that you and I can live together in the way that my ancestors lived with your ancestors? It's better on land. They replied, are you the one that they call the cleverest of animals? You're not clever but foolish. If we are afraid in the element in which we live, how much more so in the element in which we would die? I, I am fearful in the water, but I'm dead outside of it. 
So it is with us. And now Rabbi Akiva turns to the story of the Jewish people. Is such is our condition when we sit, sit and study the Torah, that is, the fact that we are persecuted when we study the Torah, of which it is written, for that is your life and the length of your days, if we go and neglect it, how much worse off would it be? Think about the rhetorical shift that's taking place here in the text. What Rabbi Akiva is suggesting is that the natural condition of the Jew is to be committed to the Jewish things that the Jew is committed to. And the fact that I, when I'm committed to those things, it makes me other to the cultural environment in which I'm in, just reinforces that I am essentially other. I don't really belong here. But better that I not belong here and be true to myself and my values than to simply abandon that truth to myself and my values by not studying Torah at all. Needless to say, the story doesn't end well for Rabbi Akiva. It is related that soon afterwards, Rabbi Akiva was arrested and thrown into prison. And Papos ben Yehuda was also arrested and imprisoned next to him. A very evocative text about the history of anti-Semitism. And Jews who believe this story of anti-Semitism believe very deeply that one way or another, you can run, but you can't hide. Whether it is the Rabbi Akivas of the world or the Papos ben Yehudas of the world, you can mask yourself in these cultural environments, but you are so fundamentally other that when they eventually come for us, we'll be grouped together in the same prison. And when Papo sees him, he says, he says, I'm skipping a line, happy are you, Rabbi Akiva, that you have been seized for busying yourself with Torah. Alas for Papos, that's himself, who has been seized for busying himself with idle things. At least you embracing your otherness meant that you, the stuff that you were doing was actually worth your time. The story results in Rabbi Akiva's famous martyrdom, his flesh being, um, his, his flesh being uh, combed with combs, and his ultimate devotion to God. And oftentimes, actually, the story is cited much more for the second half about Rabbi, the depth of Rabbi Akiva's devotion than the cultural and political argument that's actually being argued throughout. Rabbi Akiva is insisting, contrary to the narrative of Rabban Gamliel, that we Jews are never fully at home in these environments, and that our best bet is to maintain our essential otherness because eventually it's going to catch up to us one way or another. The modern equivalent of this, which turns it into literally a neoconservative political ideology, the right-wing understanding of this is expressed by Leo Strauss, who writes in 1965 as follows, "There's there's a Jewish problem which is humanly soluble, the problem of the Western Jewish individual who, or whose parents, severed his connection with the Jewish community in the expectation that he would thus become a normal member of a purely liberal or human universal society, and who is naturally perplexed when he finds no such society. The solution to his problem is to return to the Jewish community, the community established by the Jewish faith and Jewish way of life, a process that Strauss calls teshuva. Repentance, according to Leo Strauss, is that Jews have this idea out there that there's such a thing called universalism. Jews love universalism. We are Esperanto, one of the great examples of how Jews could contribute to the formation of a universalistic discourse. And Strauss, with this, winds up turning itself into a Jewish political ideology, says that is the classic Jewish modern naivete believing in the possibility of moral and universal values in the societies in which you're living, and you're going to discover when you go out there, when the Jew goes out to found the Universalist Club, that it's only Jews. (laughs) There is no such society of universalism. And when the Jew realizes that, the wise thing for the Jew to do, like Rebbe Akiva says, the wise thing is, might as well just be committed to your own stuff is to stick with your particularism, and maybe it'll be bad for us, but at least you've come about what's bad for us honestly. We know the politics that this approach to our own story engenders. It engenders a politics of dark alliances, allying ourselves with people who may not be our kindred spirits, but who we are for our basic goal is surviving as long as we can, we'll figure out who's on the up and up and who's not. 
It's a politics of self-preservation. It's a politics of constant obsession, not with what should the Jews do, but what is good for the Jews. A politics of deep anxiety. Sometimes, however, this can produce a left-wing politics too. Jews who see themselves as morally and counterculturally other to the environments that they're in, who use the phrase over and over again, for we too were slaves in the land of Egypt, as a means of catalyzing their empathy for other Jews, what they're essentially doing is saying, we are other, but our job is to make sure that others aren't other. They're not claiming the universalism of the first story, they're claiming the deep particularism of the second story and saying, for instance, I'm committed to being other, I know that I'm other, I know that as a Jew I'll never be fully accepted, and it's precisely because I know that I'll never be accepted that it's my responsibility to make sure that the new Jews, aka Muslims, are also accepted in this society. You see that that's actually a, um, it's an Akiva story wedded to a certain left-wing political outcome. These are two stories that are four. Two stories of Jewish identity, each of which can translate into different political postures. When likely, each of us is probably attached more comfortably to one story than the other one, and probably to one political identity more than the other. In other words, each of us is playing in some ways with fire, that we're wedded to a particular story of how Judaism works in the society that we're in, and we're also wedded to the political consequences of that story. And the reason I call that playing with fire is the reason I opened tonight, is that what happens when counterfactuals of the world in which you're living conflict with the story that you've been telling about yourself for quite so long? There's one more complicating layer, and then I'll wrap up and open up for some questions. The last complicating layer is American exceptionalism itself. The truth is, both the Democratic campaign and the Republican campaign were exceptionalist narratives. There is no prominent political viewpoint in America that contests the notion of American exceptionalism. It's Jill Stein and didn't get that much um, traction in the polls. Both of the exceptionalisms um, were quite frequent. Make America great again was an exceptionalist argument that once upon a time we were great, and the Clinton campaign's rebuttal was often that America is already great. It didn't say stop talking about, they didn't say it wasn't so great in the 50s. They said, no, no, America is already great, and offered a progressive version of history that we can be even greater than we've been. And here's the other problem is that our version of Jewish exceptionalism sits squarely in between those two stories. One of the great Jewish expressions of imagining the Messianic age, our version of make America great again, is the Hebrew biblical phrase, tuchzar atara liyoshna, may the crown be restored to the place of its former greatness. It sounds a little bit too much like make America great again, but what it suggests is that we are longing for greatness by imagining a past that never really existed. And by doing that, we're squarely in between a story of one type of exceptionalism and another type of exceptionalism. So I guess the good news is that our story is still weirdly tied up with this big American story and this place in which we're living. Right? If we're talking about exceptionalism as part of our vision for the Jewish past and the Jewish future, and it correlates sometimes with a right-wing American political narrative and sometimes with a left-wing political narrative, then we're at least still in the ballgame. Jewishness is not a rejection of American exceptionalism, even as our visions for Jewishness is navigating uncomfortably between these two stories. But the harder news that I'm struggling with and that I'm, I'm eager to struggle with you tonight is that we're challenged to take more seriously than we're inclined to do, that we may be living in a different story than we thought we were and that we think we are, both about what America is. I think the most jarring for me, ex jarring experience of last night is not the guy who wins, but the people who vote for him. 
what is it about America that I didn't see and never understood? And the second piece is not just about America, but about the Jewish story that I've been telling about what it means to be in America. When, such, when values that seem so to me at odds with a story of Jewish moral responsibility, universalism, social justice, these dominant stories that have been so critical to how we Americans, American Jews have constructed our identity, as the Gamliels in the Aphrodite's bath, insistent that those who would come and reduce our public squares to the mere particularism that we don't agree in are doing something damaging to a society that we own as much as, if not more than anybody else, when we see a gap between that and an electorate that does not share those values, I begin to wonder, what am I not seeing that I've been so blinded by my Jewish story? How much must I be conscious that the world is a little bit more Akiva than it is Gamliel? What happens, and this is an institutional question for us, we talk incessantly, almost to a point of parody, about the problem with the crisis narrative. We talk about it as it relates to the state of Israel. I talk about it tonight as it relates to the American Jewish community. What happens if you're not paranoid, but people are actually chasing you? <laughs> what happens if it turns out that that fear that my grandparents and great-grandparents carried epigenetically through their body of something is gonna give, keep a suitcase packed, the society that you live in is not the one that you think it is, what happens if that story starts to show signs of being truer today than I think many of us had hoped would be the case? So tonight, first, I want us to hold these two stories, two stories of what it means to be an American Jew in a vulnerable and possibly dangerous American political moment. I wanna challenge us to hold the two and think about whether in some ways we need a course corrective. Again, not a course corrective away from moral responsibility, but a course corrective that says, if I catalyze a little bit of the second story, what does it demand of me? Because ultimately, our goal as Jews, and America provides this opportunity unbelievably, is not to be passive players in our own story. America, our agency, our affluence, our responsibility allows us, or maybe obligates us, to develop the moral and political tools to actively close the gap between the world that we have and the world that we want. I felt for the last 24 hours like I was in jet lag, somehow caught between some place that we are supposed to be that I haven't caught up to yet. <laughs> And, and maybe we're gonna catch up faster than we think. That seems to me a little bit scary. If we're actually heading in a different direction with this country and with who American Jews are in this country, that'll be very jarring. If we're not, if this is all just hysterical, what do we learn from the experience of seeing a window into something that we hadn't seen before? And most of all, how do we work together collectively to close the gap between the stories that we tell about ourselves and the world in which we want to live. Thank you. I, I was just asking if I'm permitted to make a statement as opposed to a question. I'm told I should put this as a question. <clears throat> I have to say, uh, I wonder whether we uh, are going as deeply as we can uh, and are benefiting ourselves in thinking about what's rich in Jewish truth and tradition um, when we hook on to questions of identity uh, and the other. So if, if you look at this second story, I don't read it as about the truth that we are another. I, I read Akiba expressing a truth that the Torah, for him, uh, was a, a place of life. And if others look at Akiba uh, as another, it's more their issue. 
But if we want to find real truth, our focus, our place of enrichment, seems to me is not about identifying oneself as the other. Um, and I think even the very question of Jewish identity, I think gets us tied up in knots because of this kind of thinking. Great. So I'm putting that out as a question. Just end it on a question mark. Um, um, yeah, got it. Look, there are a lot of directions to go, and I think you're right. I think Jewish identity is one of them. I think I, I share with you the fear that when we only talk about identity, it's, it can ultimately be a deeply narcissistic conversation. In fact, oftentimes in the larger Jewish communities, conversations about Jewish identity, there's oftentimes a, oftentimes a construct that's, that's created by the critics of the Jewish identity conversation, which says, stop talking about identity, instead talk about meaning. And wherever we wind up as a result of really searching through the meaning, that identity will be okay. I think that's an interesting question. I think it's an important critique. What I'm suggesting is that one piece of the story, and that's it, one piece of the story is that there is a waking up in America for American Jews and wondering, and maybe if I'm, if I'm only the data set of one, then maybe that's it, of waking up and saying, who are we in this story? A story that has made a lot of sense to us for a long time, but may be on the verge of meaning something radically different today. And for that alone, that's the question that I wanted to ask tonight. Hi, uh, I thought it was a very interesting talk and uh, take some time to digest. But a question I had um, was, do you have any suggestions on how, how we deal with the fact that we may be getting it from both sides? And what I mean by that is you have Trump, you have you know, all the stuff going on in America, whatever. But then also in Israel, you have you know, like the rabbis who go to the wall, the, reforming conservatives, and then there's you know, the tussle, and there was an agreement, but it doesn't seem to be happening, yeah. et cetera. Um, so it's like, or rabbis that um, approve conversions here in America that are not approved by some of the rabbis in, right. in Israel. So you know, how do we deal with being, it sounds like in the middle. I mean, one quick point I know is, supposedly there's a website if you want to move to Canada and right after the election, it crashed, yeah, it crashed because yeah. there were so many people trying to access it, yeah. it died. Um, I don't think the answer is move to Canada. Um, and I will say that I think virtually everything that I offered tonight about this struggle for American Jewish identity, if I took out American and said Israeli, could be an equally valid talk. <laughs> I think the struggle between um, that sense of native confidence and what that breeds in terms of an Israeli Jewish identity versus a native sense of enduring otherness would translate into a totally different Israeli Jewish and political identity. I think what's surprising to me is feeling it here and feeling that sense of navigating the same story. And I don't, there are no, you know, if, if I was in a different profession, and that's what I was doing, I would say, okay, here are, here's the political playbook for how people who feel like their agenda is losing are supposed to respond for the next four years. I don't do that. But what, I, what I'm, I guess, putting on the table is that maybe these are um, the tent poles that we need to be inhabiting that signal that something is evolving and moving and that we might need to move around within our own tent in terms of how we think about ourselves. And the consequences of our familiarity with both of these stories has the potential to not only refine the stories we tell and not only refine our moral caliber, but ultimately will refine our politics because our politics oftentimes derive from the depths of the commitments to the stories that we tell ourselves and not merely um, to, you know, to this policy or that policy. So I, my only response to what do we do is the one that I go to myself is say, well, how do we continue to to ask these questions and do this work in community. And in that respect, it's just incredibly heartening that people are coming out here an evening after the elections to, to be part of that conversation. Um, this is very interesting, thank you. Uh, my very old uncle, Willie, of blessed memory, 
emigrated from, escaped from Romania through Brazil and found himself in New York. And he rented a teeny little apartment in Brighton Beach before there were any Russian immigrants right by the water and raised a family there and lived there for 50 years because he thought if he ever needed to get away again, there was the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a young teenager, I remember thinking, I'll, I'll use your, your stories today, he was the Akiva and I was the Gamaliel, like, come on, Uncle Willie, this is America. So Lou and I are parents of an 18-year-old and a 19-year-old. And my question for you is, to what extent in your travels have you seen this to be generational? And to what extent do you think what happened yesterday might change your answer? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it, there are definitely generational trends in the shift from Akiva to Gamaliel. Um, but it's not, it's not universalizable. And I think we get into a lot of trouble when we assume that, that it's universalizable. And I think the other major problem that we have is that since we identify these as opposite stories rather than in some ways twin stories, we can't communicate from the poles at the center between the Akivas and the Gamliels. Um, and the tendency therefore is, and this is kind of a classic generational problem, when one generation says to the next generation, how come you don't remember the things we experienced they are signaling that they don't really know how memory works, right? By definition, right? You, the one generation makes choices precisely because they are the Akiva generation to make possible the Gamaliel generation. Um, and because you make those choices, because success for a next generation looks radically different than success for the previous generation, um, you, you, you create the incom incompatibility of seeing these stories as together. I guess part of my, my what I'm pushing is, how do we find a way to, to normalize both of these stories as critical to our Jewish education, our Jewish vocabulary? How do we, without being too opportunistic, use the present moment to signal this might not be the story that we totally thought it was, but not to do so in ways that, that don't involve then closing us off from the moral obligations of the Gamliels? See, oftentimes the reason why a younger generation of Jews is so skeptical about the safety and crisis narrative of their parents' generation is because it's, it doesn't come in a vacuum. This is a way to understand the world. It comes with an, a sometimes implicit, sometimes explicit set of moral obligations that are being conveyed that you're not doing something right and you need to stop with your universalism. And if we, well, the more you do that, the more you bridge immediately from telling a story to very concrete political out outcomes, you undermine the integrity and the legitimacy of just holding the story uh, as it is. Um, I, I understand, I think, what you're saying about what didn't we understand about the people who voted for Trump and what did we not get. What I'm having trouble understanding is why we think this has an impact on the Jewish identity part. I'm, I'm not understanding that. I have a gap in my So two things. Um, somewhere between 18 to 24% of Jews in America voted for Donald Trump. So that's number one. Um, so um, I'm not actually making those numbers up. I've read them. They may not be true because it turns out none of the polling beforehand was true. So, um, um, but a significant percentage of the Jewish community is thinking with a very different story about what's working and not working about the American story. And I would say as a corollary, thinking very differently about what's working and not working about the Jewish story that we tell ourselves. And needless to say, there are, there are, there are many Jews in the Jewish community who are not just voting for Trump because he is of a particular party and a particular set of political outcomes but because of larger ideological considerations. Um, but I also think that because I'm just experienced, my own, my own feeling about anti-Semitism in the world has shifted uh, over the course of this campaign and it's shifted in America. And I, um, I think we are remiss not to take that seriously. I have been in the past, and this is like, you know, my sins I'm calling, you know, today. I have at times been glib about the anti-Semitism that we experience in America as being a kind of quaint or um, unthreatening Twitter phenomenon because it allows people to hide behind um, handles in which their names are not exposed and it doesn't amount to something. Um, I'm, I'm less glib 
Um, the minute that the classic problem for anti-Semitism was that it was always there, but it was when it got juxtaposed to official state structures, it moved from being a toxic idea to actually public policy. And what we've done so extraordinarily well in this country is we've been able to preserve anti-Semitism as being a discourse that's other than the state system. So it has always been something that is considered at odds with the, the way in which the state is gonna operate. I'm not, I'm not a fear monger, but something is different now today in America, and it requires of us as Jews to take seriously then those stories that it was very convenient for our American identities not to have to wrestle with and to, in, to consider the implications of what it means to hold those. So you partly uh, entered the, the area that I was going to ask you about. So in the second story, in the Akiva story, um, it's, not a, it's not a happy ending. No. Um, and y now you just said, well, we're going to have to be much more uh, vigilant and aware. So, you know, what it raises for me is, how do we go from this new awareness to a place where we restore a society, government, whatever, you know, we, where we can come back to a place where things are less threatening, but also just in general more just and, with, and within keeping of, of the values that we hold. Yeah, I think I, I'm gonna give you a simplistic answer and I apologize for that. I think part of what happens when we get rattled by a story um, is that we wind up making um, a lot of change really quickly in ways that are ultimately then destructive to us. One of the things that to me, the Akiva Gamliel holding these paradigms together reminds me <coughs> is that at their core, universalism and particularism are linked. In our Jewish communal discourse and our policy, we construct them as being opposite conversations, caring for your own and caring for others as though that's a zero sum game. But actually when they work effectively, they drive the effectiveness of each of them much more powerfully. When we care about the world in which we're in, when we care about others who are not of, uh, of us, it reinforces the mission of why it is we exist in the world to begin with. And at the same time, when we care about our own people, we are prompting the question that our tradition has always placed before us, which is, it ain't, it's not exclusively about you. <laughs> You know, we have so many reminders of this throughout biblical tradition, the best of which is the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah basically is an ultimate parable of a Jew who thinks that this is somehow all about him. And God says to him, literally at the end of the book, this was never about you. There's a bigger mission that's supposed to be accomplished in the world and you are exclusively a, ve a vehicle. And to the extent that, our, that we as a Jewish community invest in sustaining ourselves, it is because we see ourselves as vehicular towards doing something that's much bigger than ourselves. So it's not how do we stop being Gamaliel and start being Akiva. It's how do we recognize that Akiva and Gamaliel are kin. They're actually of the same family. They're of the same school. And that there are environmental or circumstantial moments that make us feel that the environment that we're in is a bathhouse versus the torture chamber but nothing has necessarily changed in our capacity to hold these two together. And I do wanna say just in appreciation of, um, of my colleagues at the ADL, I think they're actually, they are doing incredible work right now in America. Um, and we have, to, we have to name it, we have to acknowledge it. They are, at one hand, vigilantly fighting anti-Semitism as it is, as it is um, burst out on the internet. They are at the same time leading the way, sometimes beneath the surface in ways for which they're not getting enough credit at about combating Islamophobia because they understand that those discourses are actually, they are, um, they are viruses of the same family. And those, that, that could be a model for us to think about. How do we understand that these, these ideas reinforce each other rather than thinking, oh, this changed and now I have to pivot into the other. Yes. I uh, just wanted to say thank you for everything that you said tonight, it was phenomenal. Um, I think that something that really resonated with me was sort of this feeling last night and all of today, that jet lag feeling and sort of that feeling of being almost dissimilar from 55 million people. Um, seeing a story that I was very much assuming would play out and then seeing the reality 
And you mentioned um, feeling like you couldn't quite empathize just yet, or that empathy wasn't you know, something that maybe is natural for you at this moment. That's very much something that I'm struggling with as well. It's, it's something that I try and practice daily. Do you mind kind of sharing more about kind of what you're going through there? Yeah. There was a, <clears throat> an op-ed online today that said something to the effect of like, you want to you wanna make change, invite a Trump voter for Shabbat dinner. I was like, okay. Um, first of all, it's not really true that we're in, people do live in echo chambers um, and increasingly in our, um, in our synagogues, our synagogues are political echo chambers. I have had, I've heard more and more in the last couple of years something I thought I would never hear, which is, I don't go to that shul, that's the Republican shul. Um, so we have, as, as American Jews, turned our religious life into a microcosm of the larger American culture which we're in, in which politics are a primary identity and religion is a second one. But I would say even when that's the case, we all know people who voted differently than we did. You all do. If you, if you claim that you don't, you're just not paying attention. They're probably related to you. Um, so, it's not so it's not so clear that the urgent need right now is to connect with people who are different than you because you already probably are connected with them. And I guess what, bris what was bristling to me about that agenda item is that it doesn't allow for people to grieve sometimes that they've lost. And it also places on those who have lost this very heavy burden of moral responsibility of assuming that the reason that we lost was some sort of failure of empathy on our part. Um, now, I think that it is a public policy agenda that we should be all committed to of thinking about how to build political pluralism and civility in this country. I think it is critical, and I think our politicians won't help us, and the system won't help us, and we're going to have to find ways um, in our communities to transcend that. I think it's a really important agenda item. I guess I need to, I need to land back on Earth <laughs> Um, and feel a sense that I think I've seen just around of, of the urgency of grieving. That's a real thing. Um, the urgency of, um, of being able to hold on to that sense that we may have lost because other, more people were committed to their ideas and not, and not just we lost because mea culpa hear all the things that we did wrong. And I think in some ways that not, not making it the first priority to cultivate empathy for a political candidate who for many of us represents the worst of our nightmares is just a means of taking back a little bit of the dignity of realizing that I'm still located primarily in a different story. I guess eventually, um, you know, I'm hoping to be able to get there. I'd like to uh, offer the last question yeah. to the mayor of Tinek, yes. Mohammed Amidadin, who is here. Thank you. Uh, Yehuda, I, I've, I've come to give you some uh, candy to talk about my anxiety. So uh, the Muslim anxiety right now that I feel, uh, and I was looking at your perspective uh, from the Jewish identity perspective is, is this a time for Muslims to duck and cover, as sometimes was done in Jewish history? Or is it a time to overtly challenge uh, the Islamophobia uh, or anti-Muslim bigotry for what it is? Um, because I think that this is a time that I don't know which way to go because my natural inclination is to confront. But I have never seen hate like this in my 40 years on earth. So I was wondering, you know, your take on that. First of all, thank you for being here. It's very moving that you're here. Um, you crossed a lot of boundaries to come here tonight. You know, most prominently, obviously, the bridge. Um, <laughs> but, um, um, you know, to enter into this conversation, I think, reaffirms to me that um, the gap, the bigger gaps are not between um, Jews and Muslims, and they're certainly not, and they're not even between Republicans and Democrats. It's actually between the large mass of people who are the rational and the reasonable and those who are not. <laughs> um, and that, we have to figure out ways to do that. I, you know, I, um, I've been thinking a lot about you and your community and your colleagues um, a lot over the last few years. The experience that we've um, had, you know, bringing Muslim leaders to Israel and studying with the Hartman Institute originated from a sense of we need, we want to be able to talk to people and we're, we're divided by 
um, being kind of political warriors for a proxy war that's very far away um, that is hampering our ability as Jews and Muslims to actually be um, the kind of partners who we could be in America and who more importantly, and we've talked about this, um, this is the only place in the world right now where a relationship with Jewish, Jews and Muslims um, is really possible. A really powerful, empathetic, and meaningful relationship between Jews and Muslims is really possible. And so that urgency is so big. And since, um, since we've begun this work, I've been very personally impacted by the stories that I've heard from leaders in the Muslim community about what they're experiencing that's reported, and more powerfully, what they're experiencing that is not reported. Um, there is um, a tremendous amount of fear and hiding. Um, and I see at play, as you talk about, the two types of responses, either stand up to it or, you know, or go into the bunker. I want to say a, a couple of things. I don't have a good answer. We in Jewish history have uh, tried both. It's not been great. Um, uh, and oftentimes, we have made the wrong choice at the wrong time. Um, and waited too long to figure out what it is that we were supposed to do. I hope that I hope that a conversation like this um, is possible to be more widespread in the Jewish community, and then possibly one that Muslims and Jews can have together. Um, I think locating it in our text, in our historical memory, makes it possible to start talk about the present without the emotional baggage that comes with just talking about the present. We're not talking about Islamophobia right now, we're talking about Akiva and Gamaliel. <laughs> and it enables you to come and hear your own story and see yourself as part of it. So I hope that that's possible. And I really do hope that um, without, I, I genuinely don't believe that the Jewish community has an answer for itself on this question, much less the answer to provide to another community as it's struggling. But maybe we could struggle with it together. Thank you.